On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including a rocket that's about to crash into the moon. China released their five-year plan for spaceflight expansion. Rocket Labs show off their helicopter catch protocol. Starlink gets a more robust upgrade. And the SLS gets one step closer to the moon. So let's get going. This is the space race. A rocket is going to crash into the moon. Sounds scary, right? Well, it's actually not that big of a deal, though it is pretty cool. So a SpaceX Falcon 9 upper stage rocket booster has been floating around between the Earth and the moon from a mission launched back in 2015. SpaceX was tasked to launch NOAA's Deep Space Climate Observatory out to the Earth-Sun L1 Lagrange point which is opposite the L2 point that NASA's James Webb Space Telescope is currently orbiting at. DSCOVR was actually the first SpaceX mission to leave Earth's orbit and was the first time the Falcon second stage couldn't use the Earth's atmosphere to deorbit itself. Thus, it was just left floating aimlessly around the Earth and Moon. Most objects that end up in this gray zone are affected by the Moon's orbit in one of two ways. Either they get a gravitational slingshot into the sun, or they get pulled into the moon and crash on the surface. So that's why this particular rocket section is going to smash into the moon. Unfortunately, the smash itself is probably going to happen on the far side of the moon, so we won't actually get to watch it happen. This whole thing should go down in early March, and the 4-ton SpaceX vehicle will impact the moon at something like 2.5 kilometers per second. So it's going to make a pretty big bang and leave behind a visible crater. This will also be a great opportunity for missions like NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter to study the effect of a lunar impact. This is something NASA used to do back in the day, crashing used rocket stages into the moon just to see what would happen. Most notably during the Apollo program, NASA would impact both the Saturn V third stage and the lunar module's ascent stage into the surface. Then seismometers would record the moonquakes that occurred as a result. So this should be a really cool event to study at the very least. Should we name the resulting crater after Elon Musk? Comment your other suggestions down below. China has released a new white paper outlining their five-year plan for how spaceflight activities will fit into the country's overall national strategy. It shouldn't come as any surprise that China will be putting priority on ramping up development of its space transportation capabilities, doing things like testing out new technology, and launching more exploratory missions. China also noted that crewed lunar landings, orbital servicing, and work on planetary defense will be key areas for research and development in the coming years. These space program white papers are released by the Chinese once every five years, and this most recent edition was published on January 28th. So we get a fairly rare opportunity to look at what role China is planning to take in the future of space exploration. We know that they've already been working on a lot just in very recent years. The Baidu satellite navigation system, rover explorations on the far side of the moon, building a space station, and even landing on Mars. China's exploration goals for the next five years include the launch of the Chang'e 6 lunar sample return and the complex Chang'e 7 missions to the moon's south pole, a joint asteroid sample return, a comet rendezvous mission, research and development on key technology for the Chang'e 8 lunar base precursor mission, and completing key technological research on Mars sample return and Jupiter missions. So that's a lot to take in. It's pretty clear that China is setting the stage for their own crewed missions to the moon, which they still expect to achieve sometime around 2030. Unlike the Artemis program, which right now seems to be only focused on getting boots on the ground as soon as possible, China has this plan to go ahead and establish infrastructure, including the first elements of a moon base, before their astronauts arrive. We can also see that China is working on a new generation of crew launch vehicles to support lunar missions, along with a super heavy lift rocket that would construct their space-based solar power station, and even a reusable space plane system. So there's a lot of really cool new space tech coming out of China in the next few years that we can look forward to. As Westerners, I'm sure they won't let us anywhere near any of it, but at least we can go gawk at it from a distance. 
Reusable rockets are all the rage these days. SpaceX are landing boosters on drone ships and pads, which is still insane, while at the same time also building a giant rocket catching robot tower, which is even more insane. Over at Rocket Lab, a small satellite launching startup with big dreams, they're taking a more low tech but still really cool approach to avoiding losing their boosters to the cruel sea. Rocket Lab is catching rockets with helicopter. The basic idea is that the electron first stage booster will fall back towards the Earth following separation with the payload stage, just like any other rocket booster. But what's different about the electron is it will spring a parachute after re-entering the atmosphere, and that should slow the booster down enough that it can actually be caught in mid-air by a helicopter. The Electron is a good candidate for this kind of recovery because it is a relatively small booster that is made from a carbon fiber shell, so it's also extremely light. Light enough that it can be caught with a regular old helicopter. This is an idea that Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck has been floating for a while, but just the other day, on January 24th, the company released this really cool footage of a parachute and recovery test. This is just really fun to watch. Essentially, they just lifted a booster very high off the ground with one helicopter and then let it go above the ocean. Then the parachute deploys and the booster floats down gracefully before a second helicopter comes along and grabs the parachute rigging from above. We have yet to see Rocket Lab attempt a live recovery of the Electron on a real orbital mission, but it should be coming up at some point this year, which will be really fun to watch and if successful, would make them just the second aerospace company to achieve that milestone. So, good on you for not just throwing rockets into the ocean like garbage. Also worth noting, Rocket Lab isn't the only company looking at mid-air recovery to reuse a rocket engine. United Launch Alliance aims to implement what they call smart reuse with its upcoming Vulcan rocket. With this plan, the BE-4 engine on the rocket's first stage would be ejected in space with an inflatable heat shield to protect them on re-entry. After making it back into the atmosphere, a parachute would deploy from the engines. They would then be caught mid-air to be installed on a new Vulcan first stage. Now, that's just the engines coming back down for recovery, not the entire booster stage, but it's still recycling to some degree, and that's pretty cool. On January 21st, SpaceX filed an application with the FCC for the operation of a new, more ruggedized Starlink user terminal. The new terminal would be better suited for harsh weather and operating conditions, particularly high heat. This joins a previous application to operate similarly ruggedized terminals on moving vehicles such as trucks, aircraft, and ships. This updated terminal would hopefully fix the overheating issue that some users have faced already. Both the original round terminal and even the updated square terminal have thermal cutoffs at 122 degrees Fahrenheit, and when placed on a hot roof in the sun, that number is easier to reach than you would think. The previous application said of the ruggedized terminals, Compared to other dishes SpaceX Services proposes to deploy, the HP model has been ruggedized to handle harsher environments so that, for example, it will be able to continue to operate at greater extremes of heat and cold, will have improved snow ice melt capabilities, and will withstand a greater number of thermal cycles. Whether these high-performance terminals will become available to the general public remains in question. The application seems to point to these being a primarily commercial slash government slash military application. It says SpaceX services will ensure installation of HP terminals on vehicles, vessels, and aircraft by qualified installers who have an understanding of the antenna's radiation environment and are best suited to maximize protection of the general public and persons operating the vehicle and equipment. So we know in the past, SpaceX and Elon Musk have been talking about installing these on passenger jet planes for reliable in-flight Wi-Fi. We've also seen SpaceX experiment with installing terminals on Starship rockets as well. I'd say we're going to be seeing Starlink pop up all over the place in the next few years. We are inching closer and closer to the long-awaited flight of NASA's Space Launch System rocket. Engineers just completed another milestone test working towards seeing SLS roll out 
from the vehicle assembly building for the first time ever. Engineers conducted the second countdown test of the SLS rocket. This test checked to make sure ground software and what is known as the sequencer performed as intended. A launch sequencer is basically just a software program that controls the launch countdown. Nothing terribly exciting, but obviously very important. While humans are in the loop, the sequencer is checking to make sure everything is starting on time and performing smoothly. If something is not acting as intended, it can hold the countdown or even abort it automatically. The sequencer would take over complete control at T-30 seconds during an actual countdown. This test concluded before that point. The next major step will be to roll the SLS out to Launch Complex 39B at Kennedy Space Center on top of the historic crawler transporter. The journey will be the first time we will see the SLS rocket on a launch pad in real life. No more renders. Once out at the launch site, NASA will conduct a wet dress rehearsal and then roll the rocket back to the assembly building for final checkouts before the Artemis 1 mission. I'm fully aware that this rocket has already become so old and outdated that it's hard to find anything particularly exciting about launching it, but the powers that be have decided this is the rocket that is going to launch people back to the moon. So for that reason alone, we want to see this do well. It's also kind of fun that there is now this very close race going on between the SLS and Starship to see who can launch first and claim the title of most powerful rocket ever launched. If SLS can get in the air first, then it gets to wear the crown until Starship does the same and takes over. So we're pretty stoked. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.